everyone to the National Gallery of Art. I'm Molly Donovan, Associate Curator of Modern Art. Today's program, The Role of Art in Diplomacy, Cultural Citizens, is jointly sponsored by the Foundation for Art and Preservation in Embassies and the National Gallery of Art. We bring together three exceptional arts professionals who hardly need introduction. Visual artist Theaster Gates, prodigious cellist Yo-Yo Ma, and Ford Foundation President and FAPE Vice President Darren Walker, in order of introduction. We're all eager to hear their thoughts on the subject of cultural citizenry, so rather than have me recite their exceptional achievements and qualifications, we've printed their biographies for you in the program for your reference. Each of today's panelists define their respective practices in relation to their position in society as cultural citizens. They are truly gifted professionals who have in turn made generous gifts of their unique work to society with no strings attached. Ooh. Whoa. Pun intended. <laughs> we rely on their generosity because we cannot access their gifts through our own efforts or acquire them through any other means. And so cultural production such as theirs has a different value and meaning. Their individual voices and those of their collaborators combine to enrich our cultural life both in the United States and abroad. As moderator for such an articulate and distinguished panel, I plan to just let them speak. Um, but I will also seek to further uh, round out the discussion as needed. Today's subject is rich territory, and it could easily be the focus of a week-long symposium. So let's get underway. I wanted to start out um, by having each of you define what it means to be a cultural citizen or citizen artist. Um, and I'm interested in the role that art has in our public life. Um, what is the cultural citizen's responsibility? And we can start maybe with Yo-Yo. Oh. <laughs> I wanted to get to the back of the class, but this is, this is just obviously. I think very simply, a cultural citizen is anybody who believes that the power of the art can positively impact society and they do something about it. That's it. Can I leave now? No, <laughs> sorry. We have a little more time with you. <laughs> You know, it's hard because uh, Yo-Yo is so essential. You know, he's gotten so good at being essential. You know, at least nothing else. Um, to be a citizen first, I mean, I, I feel like some of this is about kind of how do we as humans imagine our place and our stake in the world, whatever it is. And that if we could imagine that there's something beyond the basics, beyond um, beyond our own individual needs, that we start to kind of touch the things that are outside of our house, outside the studio, beyond our instrument, that if we can imagine ourselves in that citizenship, which is like my relationship to another human being, and having some empathy around that, that feels important. When you add the word creative or artist to that, then the question is, what am I willing to do? Not that art always has to be the instrument of change, 
but how do we, how do we um, think about ourselves as humans connecting with other humans and then allowing the artistic practices that we have to be kind of a, an illumination of that work in the world. And I think that I've been just trying to think about those things, kind of uh, the relationship between being human and having a passion that kind of extends beyond my studio. So first of all, congratulations to the National Gallery. It is such a privilege to be in this magical space. Yo, yeah, yeah. Indeed. And so to, to Rusty Powell and to Sharon Rockefeller and Vicki Sant and the board, I mean, we're waiting with anticipation, we New Yorkers, to see what is going to be unveiled. It's so exciting and you should be so proud of this and FAPE is so honored for our ongoing partnership with you. I think citizenship is about democracy. It is at the core, as de Tocqueville told us, what was uniquely American was our approach to citizenship and participation and our ethos as a people. At the core of that is our culture and we are stewards of that culture. And as such, we should be advocates for it and, and very passionately ensure the integrity of that culture. And our culture is not just the fine arts, it's everything from scandal and all the TV shows to the greatest art that is, are on the walls of this museum and are certainly in the embassies around the world as a result of um, FAPE's generosity. So I see it as core to our civilization and integral to our democracy. And if we, just as with our democracy, if we take it for granted, if we degrade it, if we sensationalize it, we will lose it. If I may quote Yo-Yo himself, um, you were talking at one point about citizen musicians, and you've done a lot of work with the Chicago Symphony on this. Um, citizen musicians act at the intersection of art and need. Um, and I'm interested in how you determine where the needs are. Well, I think that term started in Chicago and where Theaster lives. And I was working, and I still am, working with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And we had three goals. Um, the first one was to um, take the work of the Chicago Symphony beyond the four walls of Orchestra Hall. And what does that mean? So we investigated you know, Chicago, a world city, a city of neighborhoods, a city with strong shoulders, a can-do spirit, and we went into all the neighborhoods. And uh, in 2007, with um, Silk Road, we actually worked with Lois Weisberg, who at that time was cultural commissioner, and uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, the CSO, the University of Chicago. And throughout the year, we actually worked within the city. At one point, Tim Knowles, who's a friend, he works at the um, um, UEI, at the, uh, um, who founded some charter schools that actually have 100% graduation rate in uh, all, in 100% African American neighborhoods, which is amazing. He came to me and gave me a front page article of the Chicago Tribune, and it said, out of 100 boys that enter ninth grade in the public schools, by the time they're 25, six people of those 100 will have graduated from college. But if you're African American or Latino, it, the statistic goes to 2.5 people. Now, that was a moment that something hit me, I said, that can't be. And that was 
a need, and I think ever since that time, eight years ago, I've been thinking 24-7 in everything I do, how, you know, how we can actually help in what ways, uh, and, and there are many ways that, you know, meeting Theaster is one of the incredibly inspiring ways to see how somebody has been able to reach into the neighborhoods deeply and to create spaces of trust, of, of, of where people can be safe, safe to imagine, safe to explore. And, and I think, so th these are some of the, so Chicago Symphony, Four Walls, turning the Chicago Symphony from a recreative organization to a creative organization. And finally, with the citizen musician thing, is responding uh, to needs as part of one's job. That, that leads very naturally to our, my next question, which is about inspiration and models. You have, each of you have built and shaped a model um, for cultural citizenry. Um, and provided leadership for future generations in that shaping. Um, and I'm curious who your role models have been and who has inspired you. So I will just say that on this point of the citizen artists, why artists are so essential in a democracy? Because what you just described, Yo-Yo, was a, was a polite way of saying you were voicing your outrage at our society in this day and time when 98 out of 100 black and Latino boys who start school don't finish in college. And the thing that artists do in a democracy is make demands of that democracy to fulfill its obligation to its citizenry. And as I look back and think about the artists who have inspired me, there today is an astonishing show at MoMA of Jacob Lawrence's Great Migration Series. It is one of the most intelligently curated exhibitions I've ever witnessed. But at its core is Jacob Lawrence's demand that America address the insidious level of racism that he experienced that required him to leave what was a community of terrorism in the American South for most African Americans. And so what you see on the walls of MoMA and in the multimedia installation that Leah Dickerman organized is, is, is his rage as an artist his, his anger as an American and what he is being subjected to, the dehumanizing life that he is forced to lead. But the idea of migration is a uniquely American idea. And it is because of that that made his art so powerful and today so resonant when the idea of migration continues to be contested. And so I'm inspired by those artists who hold the mirror up. And that's what artists do best. They hold that mirror up to us and say, look at yourselves. Are you fulfilling the promise of this great democracy? The promise of equality and freedom for all? And that's what artists do, and that's what these two do so beautifully in different and more gentle ways than probably Lawrence did. You know, I was, I was gonna say, Darren, that when you, when you talk about rage, there have been moments where I felt rage. And um, in American culture, there's not really room for rage. That, that rage is policed out. Rage, people kind of get very nervous when uh, a public demonstrates it's political anxiety around the status. So I think it's rage coded that there are moments when um, one has to find other forms in addition to screaming or uh, marching 
you have to find these other forms that allow us multiple ways to articulate the code of rage. And so it's that, it's that code, that coding that happens that allows us to, to play with symbols, to think about materials in new ways, to think about um, notes and how notes might share expressed feeling. And that uh, all those things are kind of, they become embedded opportunities for artists to make more complex. Um, it's almost like a zip drive. Like we, we package it all up to a thing called a folder and then it gets unzipped and inside of it is this myriad of um, questions, concerns, anxieties, frustrations. And I, I feel like all the time I'm looking at a problem, I'm figuring out a code, I'm turning that into a set of symbols that upon initial glance, folk are like, oh, this, this is very civil. This is, these are very beautiful notes. And then if you stay in it long enough, it seduces you into a deeper kind of understanding that, that there are these things in addition to beauty that are also at stake. So beautifully expressed. My, my wife, who has taught me many things, used to say to me, honey, or maybe she didn't use such endearing terms. <laughs> <clears throat> um, she said, um, don't think of revolution, think of evolution instead because when you have revolution or you do something that is to counteract something that you say that's social injustice or something um, you will always get a backlash so think instead of evolution and in that way the image in my mind is how we tend to our garden. So we know that when we tend to a garden, you could put in invasive species of something that's going to just take over everything. But I think the garden, to me, is the first art form when we became agricultural. And, but to know your garden is to not only know, it's to know nature, is to know the soil, is to know the seasons, is to know the environment, is to know what actually is our nutrients. And um, so for me, what the, the response to is always, let's grow a better garden. You know, uh, rage is, is in a way, it's great, you let out energy, but, you know, we have anger management for that. Maybe art is a form of anger management, you know? It, it is. But I also think that along with whatever, you know, what, whatever someone needs to express, let's also tend to our civic garden at the same time. And I think that means, you know, picking up a piece of, you know, garbage out on the street that someone else is not going to pick up. You know, that's, that's a slightly, very small citizen mm -hmm. action, yeah. but it actually helps the aesthetic of, you know, clean up your highway, clean up your block, clean up. So it's just little things that add up to very large uh, um, results. But don't you also think the other side of this is arts patronage in America? Because what I also think that so, unique, and I'm, I'm not a big proponent of American exceptionalism, so I probably sound like I'm, but there is something, I mean, I, I'm lucky and get to travel to see a lot of the world, and there is something about patronage in this country that is different, in that patronage often endorses and validates the artist who is demanding of society. And so unlike in, in, in societies where the privileged actually don't like to be challenged in the way that in America, a lot of privileged people are very comfortable saying, I'm, I'm gonna write a check to this organization that's demanding we become a more equal nation or that we address inequality or racism. In many societies, 
that just doesn't happen among uh, the privileged. And in the US, we have that. And so we have this amazing tapestry uh, around our democracy upon which the, the artists and their creative production and patrons like this institution and many people in this audience spend a lot of money to support the creation of art that in many ways often makes them uncomfortable with their privilege. And I think that's something that's really, I won't name the country, but I was just in a country with a group of very um, wealthy philanthropists and they clearly are not comfortable being challenged by their citizens about the growing inequality and, and problems in their society. They're just not comfortable. And the thing I love about this country is that we, we engage in that dialectic, which is confounding and contested and filled with tension, but we engage in it. And I think that's really remarkable. Well, and I think what you're touching on is the idea that we're all seeking out education. You know, we're all, our, the artists, our cultural citizens are educating us and we all value that greatly and each one of you is a teacher in some respect and edu arts education plays a very important role in your actual practice um theaster you're a professional visual you know professor at, at university of chicago and you run the arts incubator um as its director um yo yo ma you've de developed this incredible passion driven um uh, educational model at Harvard um, and Darren you know you head up one of the world's largest foundations whose mission um, prioritizes education um, and uh, I'm I'm just want to hear you talk about um, this educational project in each of your practices um, that you build and through which you build community across the globe um, and the role that art plays in all of this. So, so you know, in many ways, uh, sometimes if, if Darren and I were having a, a private conversation. We don't want to go there at the end. I promise to keep it clean. That, that one of the things that might be kind of a, an anxiety if you will, is that often artists are called upon to do things that are way above their pay grade, way above um, uh, their daily capacity. When there are people in the world who get paid to think about these things like education or like, like uh, hunger or um, homelessness, that there are people every day that, uh, whose job it is to kind of think broadly, who have budgets to think about these things in some kind of way within those bureaucracies it still slips by us that, that in a way we miss, we, miss, um, we miss all of the possibility because of the letter. Um, but I think that there are moments um, when uh, artistic practices allow us the creation of new platforms that simply want to be effective. So it's like, I don't want to be a department of education, but I want to make sure that the kids in my neighborhood get tutored. And so one doesn't have to be head of the Department of Education in order to make that happen. That feels like citizenship. And so in some ways, I feel like the creation of art parlays beautifully into the creation of other kinds of platforms. One platform might be an education platform. But in a way, um, at least for me, contemporary art practices is no longer about whether or not I can make a good painting or a nice sculpture. It has to do with like, Am I willing to grapple with the world and then invent the kind of platforms I need in order to launch new ideas? And so uh, it is true that there's a part of my practice that thinks about education, but I think that, that that is part and parcel of a practice that's like empathic, a, a practice that's listening and that education might be one of the things that's, that's needed to be thought about. And then when, when the Department of Education is thinking about it fully, then there might not be a need for me to think about that thing and my empathy will find itself somewhere else. But I, I, I think it's a pleasure to, to kind of think then alongside all of these other platforms, how can I be most useful 
especially in making sure that young people have access to great thinking that comes through art. Whoa, um, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. You know, I, I love Theaster. I've wanted to meet him for years. And, and I wanted to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Ever since Bobby McFerrin, I've been just like in love with you. <laughs> Historic moment here. Okay. Don't worry. Love fast. Be happy. <laughs> yo, yo. Uh, no. Don't it's, fall. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons is because you have been able to create these spaces. And, and I think um, on the education side, again, I think very simply, I think about how we can turn for a child uh, the, the thought that you have to do something to you want to do something. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this applies to adults also. Right? Okay. So, and <laughs> the older we are, the more responsibilities we have. Oh, I have to do this. How often this, do, we have, do we say, I have to do this? And not to just be selfish to say, I want to do this, but that's, I like to think of the preconditions of when people start to become interested, passionate. And the other word would be curious. Because if you're curious, if you're passionate, the energy and the motivation to do something is pretty much free. You don't have to sort of say, oh, I gotta spend three hours doing that. Three hours goes really quickly. So a lot of kids or parents of kids ask, how much do you practice? How do you deal with the question of practicing? Well, most people that I know, myself included, have times where we don't love practicing. <clears throat> and sometimes it's a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. and, but but what we do know is that when you're doing something that you're really interested in, time flies. It's that simple. So for me, those two elements, so how can we get kids to be curious? Mm -hmm. And how can we get them to be passionate? If a teenager is passionate about something, they'll probably not get into trouble doing other things because they are so, they have their community. They are sharing their passion with others that they've found. That's, you know, so I, I'm thinking pre-program, pre-other things, how do we, how do we do that? And that's true of anybody who walks into a museum and meets a docent and who is going to get you interested in the work of art that you might not have had a relationship with because they took you inside. And who's willing to take us into the inside of a work of art, yeah. right? Who can actually take us into a country that you visit? You can do it by bus and, not s and see things, but who's gonna take you and it interact with you so that you keep a memory that stays with you forever? Those are the, those are the types of education educational things that I think are, uh, we could really work on enhancing uh, in order to bring us to a better union. Because with that, we have the imagination, we have the empathy, we develop the empathy to launch ourselves into the world of somebody else. So I agree with everything that's been said, but one thing that hasn't been said is access. So children, of course, are curious. There's nothing that we don't know. I mean, that's axiomatic. But children need exposure. And so I think one of the things that we have to come to grips with is that most American children today aren't given exposure. Now, I lived in a little town of, in East Texas, and my grandmother was a maid. There was no, there was no art in my community, but she would bring home in the little brown piggly wiggly bags, art books from the family she worked for. Those art books transformed and transfixed my life and took me to a place completely out of that little shotgun house, away from that, that where we lived, because I was 
page by page, just being exposed, and my curiosity and my imagination totally stimulated. And so I think we have to come to grips with the reality that we don't have that exposure today. Arts are, are pitted against everything else in our society, because in many ways, I, I love the Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel, who has written about how we have moved from becoming a market economy to a market society, where the only thing that matters are those things that we can measure. And if we can't measure it, it doesn't matter. And everything is seen in the context of capital. And so it's no surprise that if that's what your culture becomes, that we lose all of these assets that are essential for a democracy. So what we don't have is a sense of, of national alarm about this. What we do have instead is a national priority for STEM, which I support because I think we do need strong math and science curricula and universities that produce computer scientists and engineers. But the thing that the Chinese and the Indians are learning from us is that you have to have critical thinking. So the irony, having recently been in China where we have an office in Beijing, is that they have realized that they're creating a society of robots. And if you don't have people who can think critically and challenge normative thinking, it's very hard to be an innovator and a leader. And so I think we have a huge challenge in this country to, to get out of this dialectic of it's the arts versus more important things. And we see it, we, I saw it recently, in, and I'm a fan of Peter Singer's, he's an amazing uh, professor at Princeton, but, but, but Peter's idea that if you give to the art, if, you, if you're a philanthropist and you give to the arts, what you're doing is of less value to society than a philanthropist who gives to a homeless shelter. And, and that, of course, we understand the hierarchy of human needs, et cetera, but to simply assert that and not have arts philanthropists stand up and say, you are wrong. I mean, that that goes unattended to, and where is the moral outrage from people who give generously to the arts? Because that's just wrong. Darren, can, can may I ask a question? Because I think you bring up a very interesting point of allying um, the arts with innovation. The arts with flexible thinking, with collaboration, with innovation. Now, everybody talks innovation in our country. Everybody thinks the future of our country will depend on how well we innovate in all different areas. So my question is this. I think the way I understand it, and many of you may know much more and contradict me, uh, if you must, uh, um, that before 1800, there was something called the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was arts, sciences, and philosophy was together. So, you know, the dean at many universities, it's the dean of arts and sciences. There's the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So what happened? And what happened to philosophy? Okay, Michael Sandel, he's great, and he is very popular. He does talk about social justice. There's John Rawls, there are people, but, but it's less actually potent in our lives to have, well, what do you, what do you believe in? What is your worldview? What do you, what is it? Are we just about competition and uh, measurable things? What happened to the inner life? What happened to beauty? Okay. I mean, why, why, 
I mean, this is the irony here. I refuse to be defensive because I believe that poor kids in America should have beauty in their lives. And that very simple notion, you're, you're made to feel marginal, completely marginal, careful there, completely marginal by, by asserting that. And I think what those of us who believe need to be more aggressive and more comfortable about is saying, of course we want to measure, of course we want the evaluation, but what about beauty? Can okay. I just ask one question? Where, where would we be without Steve Jobs' innovation, without his attention to aesthetics and beauty and simplicity and refinement? It seems like a perfect match in those products. Which and he attributes that to a course at Reed College that he audited after he dropped out in his freshman year on design and handwriting. And so his attention to detail, aesthetic detail, and his stepfather who said that when you build a piece of furniture, it's not just the front that has to be beautiful. The back, which you don't see, should also be beautiful. a moment. Uh, Dan, you mentioned two words in a paragraph. One was um, access and the other was assets. And, um, you know, one of, one of the things in, kind of in relationship to private philanthropy or even the role of the museum and the future role of private museums is that we're upon a moment where there are so many assets in the world that are um, more than a person individually has room for in one house. So we almost have to buy another house to like hold our assets. But more and more, I think that, that if we could find creative ways to make those uh, assets uh, accessible, that, that, um, that kind of what I've been doing on Dorchester is simply finding amazing archives, putting them in a house, and then opening the house. And that in a way, people are curious and turned on. Um, it doesn't matter what the asset is, in a way, if you celebrate the asset, if you program around the asset, if you educate around the asset, giving access to people, you find that all kinds of new learning, but also new communities form, um, new ideas get generated, new platforms for new kinds of um, access to assets starts to grow, and that, that it doesn't require that we become a certain uh, amount of wealthy, that I think anyone has the capacity to believe themselves to be philanthropic, and that word seems like just a big word for being generous with the stuff that you got. And so how do you, how do you kind of develop a, a mindset that everybody, that everybody has assets from the poorest neighborhoods, right? Our, our parents um, choosing to expose us to things that maybe even things that are beyond their full understanding, but they just have a sense of knowing that those things matter because I haven't looked at all the slides in my glass lantern slide archive, but I know that they're important that other people look at them all. And so, and so figuring out ways to increase access at all levels of culture and thinking. Isn't, uh, can I just ask you, isn't what you put into these spaces, might you call these objects uh, primary sources? Absolutely. You're, you're giving people access to the ways of saying, okay, so this is the original of something. Yes. And so it's like going to be an explorer or botanist in the 18th century. You're finding things for the first time. And, and that's, that's incredibly important when you take away the filters. And many of us are lucky enough to sometimes work with primary sources. And, and that's, that's a kind of beauty which actually um, sparks uh, uh, curiosity. And Yo-Yo, I think, uh, let's say that um, the idea that someone could come to my house, look at a calder on a glass slide, hold it up, and be like, what's that? And then I can say, oh, that thing exists there. That there's no way that one can understand from a computer that thing. Or they can't understand from a glass lantern slide fully um, the thing. But it's important that there's a way in which they can at least access the possibility of the thing 
and that the, the slide then makes room for saying, oh, that thing, that Calder is at the National Gallery. We could go see it, right? And, th and that there has to be a relationship between the virtual world, the kind of meta-material world, and the thing itself. And I think that that becomes a kind of ecosystem of learning and experience and knowing. Mm -hmm. Besides, just, on, yeah. your, on this point, they'll come back to, to your question, Yo-Yo, because you said, what happened? And I think it's really important to put into historical context the remarkable ascension of American culture globally and where it started in the 20th century, because it's important to remember that it was Sputnik that generated in the United States such a sense of urgency to beat the Russians at everything that they were good at. And so it's why in the 1960s, the Ford Foundation gave one of our largest art grants, and people often are, are shocked, to the School of American Ballet, because Mr. Balanchine, a Russian, was running America's great dance company. And the State Department and the White House and the Ford Foundation realized that if America had a great dance company, a classical dance company, that on the global stage would beat the Russians, that we as a global power would be enhanced and valorized. And across all of the arts in America, we saw in the 1960s, because the Ford Foundation was integrally involved, huge amounts of money being invested into all of the classical, particularly the Western canon, because it was through these efforts, our power as a global leader would be enhanced. And so the question today is, What's the goal? Where's the Sputnik? What is our motivator? Who are we trying to beat? Or do we just not care anymore? This, this speaks to um, a term that has been used in diplomatic circles as soft power. The arts as so-called soft power um, or soft vengeance um, in the terms of Albie Sachs, um, the writer of the South African Constitution. Um, and soft power, was discussed by Joseph Nye from the Harvard um, uh, Kennedy School of Government, that it, it's differentiated from other sources of power, types of power, political and economic particularly, um, because uh, it emphasizes attraction. It's non-coercive. Um, and I'm just curious about your thoughts on so-called so soft power. Um, I, I'll, I'll try have a go at this. Um, I think I would love for soft power to be called cultural power because soft implies um, sort of a stepchild. And I think, um, you know, Damien Wetzel, who is um, my buddy um, as a cultural citizen, helps helped me in saying to me that He's sick and tired of opening your hands and saying, you know, give me money. Because it's like you're always begging. So part of cultural citizenship is to actually say, okay, well, let's try and define our terms in terms of assets, like assets, right? So what are cultural assets? How much would you give to create trust? Safety. What is that worth to you? So whether you, you do social impact bonds uh, to prevent prison recidivism, pays 14%. That's pretty good. That's one way of thinking about uh, that. And so cultural power for our nation, I think if we think of all of our 320 million people as assets, if we're embarked, whether you believe in American exceptionalism or not, if we believe that we would like to have access to change the hearts and minds of 7.3 billion people, why not go to our own population and find out what is in their hearts and minds? Because if they do, since we actually contain pretty much all the peoples of the world within our citizenry, and we are a democracy, 
we then have actually access to 7.3 billion people. I would call that cultural power. And so not to see assets that, not to identify assets and then to work them, I think is actually to our great economic and political detriment. That's. Yeah, I, I, I think it's unfortunate that the only way that we can imagine power is in relationship to militarized power, if that's what we're calling hard, that there has to be room for culture, for the arts, for artists, autonomously of, of any other paradigm, that we have to really believe that, that the role that culture has played historically is landmarked enough throughout the world. And that I'm, I'm really honored. I remember um, as part of the diplomacy program, just being in Madrid uh, three, three months ago and feeling as if um, there, was, there was world change happening through Madrid as a result of the tremendous investment they were making in culture. That this huge um, uh, uh, stockyards where uh, lots of animals were uh, kind of slaughtered and, and kind of was the slaughterhouse, that that uh, two square miles had been transformed into this large um, arts uh, canopy. And uh, thinking about all of the different kinds of needs that were celebrated and promoted and platformed uh, in this in this amazing venue that, um, uh, that the government had invested in. And I think about the power that we have when we decide that art um, autonomously um, has uh, the value to transform lives and very differently than, uh, say, the University of Chicago School of Economics or, you know, like, like there are these other things that we value. And I, I wish that we had the capacity to um, put behind us the, the tremendous investment that we make and other powers to invest in what Yo-Yo is calling cultural power. But it's also why the work of organizations like FAPE is so important, because the best of American culture needs to be demonstrated to the world. And when, when we look back in the archives of the American narrative, at the time when our State Department and private philanthropy really invested in the promotion of American culture abroad, when the State Department, in the middle of the civil rights movement, when there was such alarm in the United States, because the world was seeing our cities burning and seeing clear racism happening. How could, Ameri how could the world's greatest democracy have this on its shores? The United States sent Dance Theater of Harlem, Alvin Ailey, all the Negro ensemble around the world to audiences everywhere. And that, that was transformative. It sought to demonstrate that in America, we celebrate all of our culture. And what you might be seeing on a television set in London was also offset by a dance company that you saw at Covent Garden that same week that also happened to represent the best of America. And so I think organizations like FAPE who promote the, the assemblage and the opportunity for American art to be seen, to be understood and transmitted are needed today more than ever. Because when you see at Venice what our pavilion looks like, I'm sorry to be so unkind, but, but when you see these things that are supposed to represent our culture and they feel and look so tawdry and tired, it is, it is dispiriting as an American. And so we need to be vigorously taking our culture and taking the best of it and investing in it because people around the world interpret who we are as a people through our culture. Don't you love this guy? No, I don't. This is great. No, I... It's great. I, I, I get to... Uh, no, no, no. No, you see, okay, so you're talking big scale. I want to make a small scale sort of Washington, um, uh, tell a small scale Washington story. Um, so every year, 
there's the Kennedy Center Awards. And um, my wife and I, Damien and Heather, we go there. And one year, hello, one year, um, they honored Buddy Guy. And this is such a beautiful story. And I've heard of Buddy Guy. I knew his music a little bit, but this really kind of focused on this guy. Okay, so, you know, the Stevenses honored him, and, and then I went back to my book on Muddy Waters. And, and then I, but I heard from this Kennedy Center honors that he had a club in Chicago called Legends. So I looked on the internet and said, I'm going to be there in January. Let me just check. Dates, sold out, sold out. He's not around in February. There's, my gosh, the one day that there were tickets, I was in Chicago. So we called up this guy. It was that amazing. We called up this guy, and even though we had met many times before, so like, hey, we got to do something. Yeah. Hey, man, what's going on? You know, it's like great. Yeah, but it's all friendly. But no, but we bonded yeah. that night because we sat at that table and we talked. And guess what? By some odd, crazy coincidence, this guy that just bought that very day Muddy Waters' house in Chicago, and he had the keys in his pocket. Right? And so that's a small version of what happens in culture when something happens, it gets connected into someone else's mind, and then someone does something about it, found out that there's a, a possibility of joining. It joined people together and, and I'm now totally aligned with what you're doing in the city, and I really, really want to make sure that our young musicians really go to your space, and, and we do this primary source thing. Thank you for an awesome story. Um, no, and you know, each, of, each one of you is a masterful storyteller in your own practices, in some way or another. You have a storyteller as part of the Silk Road Ensemble, Yo-Yo, for example, the Aster, your proclamations, your storytelling is legendary. Darren, you're, we're all hearing it right now. You're putting the good word out. Um, I'm just wondering how you got to this role of storyteller in your practice, and how that comes through in your work. Just the place of the storytelling. Well, I'm from the American South, and it's just a part of who, of your culture. Uh, it's all about storytelling in the South. And, and so I'm, I'm it, it just is what we do. It's our culture. You know, I'll also say that um, when, I was, when I was very young, it was the sermon, right? And, and watching these amazingly eloquent uh, men and women uh, pray, uh, have this expository experience. I remember going to see Jeremiah Wright when I was very young and thinking about urban planning and divinity, and I thought those things came together in Jeremiah Wright in Chicago. But then in my, in my teenage and high school years, it was the sermon combined with the slam and kind of the role that um, the spoken word scene started to play in urban and cities. And I found myself kind of leveraging the sermon to make better poems. Um, and, it, and then it went from there to, um, from the pulpit to the stage to teaching in a way, which is this kind of third performance where, uh, no less demanding or no more demanding than the poetry scene or the, po or the, the sermon, that in, in ways they were just different modalities of, of telling story and, and trying to gauge 
how do you, how do you deliver the best story possible, say, in tw now it's TED, right? How do you deliver the best story possible in 17 minutes? Or um, when you only have a couple seconds to hold someone's attention, how do you try to share the things that you feel really passionate about in a way that other people might consider? Uh, and so I feel really fortunate to have moved through these genre of talking, talking, talking. Talking, talking, talking. Um, well, or playing, or playing, 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 playing. Yeah. Yeah. and talking. Come on. Um, well, you know, what's funny is I didn't grow up in the American South. And, but, you could have. But I could have. You country. But I just make things up. Um, and, but I have a problem. And my problem is that... I was born confused, and I'm still confused. I'm just trying to figure things out. And as I figure things out, some things come to light. So they're temporary stories that I can tell. Now, I grew up with everybody contradicting one another. The French think they have the best country in the world. We think we have the best country in the world. My parents were Chinese. They thought they came from, you know, the greatest culture. So when we moved from Paris to New York, our French friends would say, why would you ever want to move to the United States? We have everything here. So I thought, oh, wow, then why are we moving to the States? My parents would say, you know, China, so great, it's, it's great. Why are we in the States? You know, so I was very confused as a seven-year-old, and 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 this happened also in music. Music people would say, "Oh, Shostakovich, terrible composer," from the Marlboro crowd because they came from the sort of like the Central European Viennese school, and anything east of the Iron Curtain was just not culture. Um, so I thought, wow, Shostakovich must be a terrible composer. But then you discover pretty good stuff, yeah. you know? And so I've been trying to figure out, and, and people in culture say, ah, oh, it's those businessmen. They don't understand anything. I talk to a businessman and says, ah, oh, you artists, you just make things up. Yeah. And, you know, and we all blame the politicians, yeah. right? You know, and it's like, it's never ending. We're always putting someone else down and saying our truth is better. So my problem is not everybody can be right at the same time on the same subject. So I've been trying to figure out what truth is. So you talked about beauty. Keats talked about beauty and truth. I think that's worth investigating. It's worth investigating because sometimes you can't tell certain truths in certain rooms. You just can't. You know, you're all well brought up, so you don't say certain things. Right? But isn't that the role of artists in society? Artists are truth tellers. Well, up to a certain point because we're also incredible narcissists. <laughs> well, you know, but, but I also think that maybe the way you're talking about it still upholds an older way of thinking. I'd, I'd like to think that there are many Americas. There are many truths. There are multiple ways of looking at a moment in history. And thank goodness that we have those multiple valences. And I, I think that's why when I think of Coltrane or Roach or like these moments where um, there's the same form, uh, m there's the same melodic structure, it's under there, or Nat Coleman. But then the riff on it each time is a little bit different, and that willingness to kind of iterate over and over that same form to suggest that there's new musical truths inside of that same melodic structure, I think there's some value to that in kind of how we think about history. That there may be a way of kind of riffing through that suggests that there were like multiple riffs possible on the same kind of um, uh, singular American melodic uh, uh, moment, structure. 
And so this, this idea that there might be uh, uh, multiple valences, not only in artistic practice, but also in how we imagine the world working, um, feels like then we could get a business person at the table who could come with a truth about the value of an MBA and we can get an art person at the table with the truth about an MFA and those two people accepting a kind of truth together means that there could be like a new kind of American experience, a new kind of, a new kind of business growing, a new kind of uh, uh, artistic capacity uh, being enlivened. I think that's very exciting. I got a thing. Yeah, no. I got a thing. You got a thing. Um, so you want me to play some music? Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know, since we could try this and see how it goes. Since, yes. Since um, Darren mentioned uh, the South and um, Yo-Yo mentioned the blues, why don't we just see if I can uh, invoke uh, the sermon? Yo, yo, one of my mom's uh, favorite hymns, very simple hymn, uh, it's called Walk With Me. And uh, she'd sing it when things were slightly dire. Um, and then I've kind of uh, added a verse. Was, there was another verse. She, she would say, guide my hands. Walk with me, walk with me. Walk with me, walk with me, while I'm on this tedious journey. I want you, Lord, to walk with me. Guide my hand. Guide my hand, guide my hand, guide my hand, while I'm on this tedious journey, I want you Lord, to guide my hand. Okay, there we go. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, so we talked about a number of things. We talked about um, cultural citizenship as uh, anybody who believes in the power of art or culture uh, to positively impact society and then we do something about it. Uh, we talked about uh, gardening, cultivating our garden. Uh, we talked about truth and beauty. So I'm going to attempt to put some of those thoughts in musical form. And um, I'm going to choose three movements of a piece of music. Um, the, all of them actually became part of a three-acre garden in Toronto called the Music Garden. It's a garden that was designed and 
and actually um, based on this piece of music. And um, because especially the first, first movement of that piece reminds me of the infinite variety of nature that we find in nature and in human nature. Um, and the second movement actually uh, is, is interesting because it started off as a Moorish dance that ladies used to dance to. And, well, it, it emigrated to Spain and they banned it because they said it was um, too lewd and lascivious. So, um, but then what happens when you ban something? It moves somewhere else. The Sarabande came to all over to South America and went to France. The version you will hear uh, comes from, you know what the French do, they make things courtly, right? Or at, that, at a certain time. And finally, um, a, um, a jig that is, would be our call to action. So all of this um, is, you know, comes from a lot of different places, but it was written by Bach, whom we think of as a German composer, except when he wrote it in 1720 to 22, Germany didn't exist. So you tell me what the truth is, but I'll play you the music.
So thank you to Yo-Yo, but Yo-Yo, Yo-Yo is, Yo-Yo is being presented this evening with the great honor. The Foundation for Art and Preservation in Embassies is presenting Yo-Yo with our Annenberg Medal because Yo-Yo personifies a cultural leader, a diplomat, and a great American citizen. We're so proud of you, Yo-Yo. Thank you, each and every one of you. Um, we're so grateful for your labors and service of your gifts. The Aster, Yo-Yo, Darren, thank you for coming today, and thank you to FAPE for partnering with the National Gallery to present this wonderful program.